Okay. Hello. Um, I'm just going to be talking about. Uh, oh, good. My nose is going crazy. Uh, testing one, two, three, four. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm still been continuing to play around with Docker, and one of the things I've been doing with it lately is I, I want to create a, a virtual appliance that is a a virtual machine that's been packaged such that it'll be easily implemented into VMware or VirtualBox or or whatever. So. As a starting point for this, I've been using uh, Boot to Docker, which is a it's a uh, it's a virtual machine uh, image that's about 22 megs long, so it's very tiny, and it's usually used for uh, this type of arrangement, where if you're running to run uh, Docker on a Mac or a Windows machine, obviously Docker's native to Linux, so Boot to Docker is a quick dirty virtual machine that I'll just fire up and run Docker in 22 megs. Um, <clears throat> it uses uh, Tiny Core Linux, which is some Linux distribution that does some odd things, but uh, that's mainly just to keep it tiny and simple. Um, <clears throat> and the Boot to Docker project basically has Vagrant around it to uh, fire it up, attach a, a data disk to the virtual machine, and when the virtual machine, when the uh, boot to Docker image sees this data disk that's labeled with a disk label uh, Docker data disk or something like that, I forget the initial name, uh, it automatically mounts it and connects it in such a way that uh, Docker stores all its images in the data disk. Um, so obviously, this is based on uh, Docker. So just for those who haven't heard too much about Docker, Docker's uh, a virtualization, uh, not really a virtualization, a uh, containerization uh, tool that uh, has been very popular lately. Uh, and it basically simplifies making containers. It handles all the back end stuff and basically makes it quite simple to do. Uh, I won't go into too much details about how it works. I've covered, I think most people have seen it covered before. Uh, I did want to cover a little bit about the uh, new enhancements they've put in recently. So they have gone uh, and added a Docker execute. So you can out now actually run a different command in the same container. So if you start up a container, uh, uh, start up a, a, a Docker container, and it's usually when you start it up, it's running the uh, program that you want to run in that container, usually only one pro process, uh, and Docker Exe will actually execute another process in that container uh, so as it's running in the same environment. So for instance, if you've got a uh, database container that's ru already running the database, rather than try to get in there and potentially break what's already running, you can actually do Docker Exe bash on that same container, and you get a bash shell within that container without having to uh, get into the command line on that what is probably already running inside, uh, already running the, the database server. Um, so that comes in quite handy. 
uh, it does still it does still run within the environment of the container. So it still needs. Yes, it does have to be in the container. Yeah, because it's still running within that environment. Yeah, you you could I suppose mount a different volume. To, no, I don't think Docker XE allows you to mount different volumes. But um, the other one that they added in the 1.3 version is uh, Docker Create. So normally you would do Docker Run, and you'd run your con command in that container. Docker Create allows you to create the container. So it's, the way it normally works is you have a Docker image, and when you say Docker run this image, this command, it will create a container and run that command, so, which is basically just a, uh, a writable layer on top of the image, uh, and it would run that command in that container. So Docker create creates the container, but doesn't actually run any command. It's just got the container there where you can then go do, do Docker execute to execute command within the container, or go do some other means, Docker run or whatever, just to uh, Docker run wouldn't work where. Well. So Docker actually allows you to break up the steps. So instead of having to do Docker run, which would create the container and run the command, you can now do it as two separate steps. The other thing they added was uh, security options. So they're always uh, telling us that uh, Docker is not a security app. It doesn't give you security isolation, uh, but it now has uh, options to automatically uh, set up uh, security SQLinux or App Armor labels. So when you run your container, it'll have the security Linux label and be restricted by that security Linux label. Uh, going back a little further. So going back a little further, uh, in 1.2, they added uh, restart uh, options. So you can have your Docker container automatically restart uh, on failure or uh, always. Uh, they also added uh, labels where you can, do, well, not labels, uh, options where you can drop a, uh, a capability. So Use, it used to be that you had two options. You either ran the Docker image as normal, where it was restricted with what they thought was a reasonable restrictions, or you had Docker, you ran the Docker container with the option privilege, which means it had more capabilities and less restrictions. They first of all changed it over to be a whitelist instead of a blacklist. So other way around, blacklist instead. Yeah. So it used to be that everything was enabled except for what they blocked. Now everything is disabled except for what they enabled. So it's a, a more security conscious um, way of doing it. Uh, and they added these features where you can actually add a capacity or drop a capacity uh, depending on what you want. So you might be able to say, uh, get rid of your ability to change the network stuff or get rid of your ability to do it your own or whatever. They also added uh, the option to link a device. So you used to be able to, uh, you used to have to do a uh, bind mount using the volume and mount the, the directory that you had the device in. And then you would still have to be running as a privileged mode in order to actually use that device. But now they've got this special device uh, option where you can actually link the device at a more fundamental level. Uh, Sorry? Just for that command line that you're running. I, I think they'll probably, I don't know if they do it already, but I would imagine they would probably add it to the Docker file so as it could be built with that. <laughs> A lot of the stuff that you can specify on command line can also be specified in the Docker file. So it actually, the image actually gets built with those uh, options built in, even environment variables. You can actually 
add them to the Docker file, so then your image actually has those environmental these environmental variables set to begin with, and you could still then further set additional ones or modify them with the command line. All right, so that's about it for that. Um, Docker. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I think so. It's. I don't think it's a BSD kernel, but it is a Unix kernel. So I think there's probably something like that. Jails is from BSD. Yeah. Jails is from BSD and works a similar way to what uh, containers do in Linux. But I, I would imagine it wouldn't surprise me if OS X offers something like that. But in either case, it's not. Uh, it's not the same as Docker because Docker has other things around it. The Docker repository, the the way it's built, and the, the the way it automatically does a lot of the work for you, rather than you having to code every little detail about what you want this container to be able to do. Um, yeah, so Docker boot to Docker normally works with a uh, vari uh, vagrant. Sorry. Yep. Uh, yes, I'm going to get to that. So. Customizing the uh, virtual appliance. So, boot to Docker normally runs with a Vagrant script that fires up a virtual box, starts the uh, do boot to Docker image inside that virtual box, and connects the data disk that it creates to it. So, as you have the whole scenario and it just works. Uh, but I'm taking that uh, boot to Docker image mainly because I wanted something small and I want to make a uh, OVF file out of it, or OVA file out of it, which is a uh, open uh, virtualization format. Um, still having some problems with uh, converting it to OVA, which is so an OVF file is just the file that defines what the virtual machine is going to be, uh, and you would have with that the virtual disk images that you want to be part of that virtual machine. Whereas an OVA file takes all that, compresses it to a single archive. And the idea is that you then have a single file that you point your virtualization software at, and it has everything it needs inside. The problem is the OVA expects very specific, particular things. It expects, for instance, that the tar file be in the same sequence. So the OVF file first, and the next, the first disk that it refers to, that the OVF file refers to, and the next, the second disk that the OV, OV file. OVF file refers to it expects the order to be matching what's in the uh, OVF file. Um, the other thing is it it defines the OVA file the the uh, virtual disks as being a particular uh, format, uh, and it links to the definition out on the internet of what that format's supposed to be. And the one that most of them use is uh, VMDK in streaming subformat. And that doesn't work very well. If you try to do a uh, Quemu uh, image uh, convert to a VMDK with subformat uh, streaming, it will usually fail on you. Uh, you can give this minus S option that apparently puts it into 64K chunks or whatever that makes it work. But it didn't, doesn't work under some circumstances. And it's, yeah, so I haven't quite figured that out yet. And even when I did all that right, it worked, and then when I came back to it later, it didn't work, and I'm not sure why. So, <coughs> so the boot to Docker image, the way they uh, customize it, they allow you to customize it by basically uh, building your own boot to Docker ISO. Um, now, they do this by actually having a Docker image that contains all the bits and pieces, including the script, that actually builds the ISO. So you basically just do this uh, Docker build, uh, and you grab the uh, boot to Docker, and you basically just run it uh, and pipe it to your uh, ISO image that you want. 
the default command for this boot to Docker run is to run the script called make ISO. So all it basically does is you've got the inside the Docker image, all the bits it needs, and it just runs the make to make ISO dot shell script and outputs the uh, boot to Docker ISO image. You can then cut just like any other Docker con uh, Docker container. You can uh, use your own uh, uh, Docker file to take that boot to Docker image and then add your own uh, bits and pieces to it, including your own scripts, etc., and run the ISO again, and you'll get your alternative ISO image built. So that's what I was trying to do. Um, so in here, uh, if I do cats, uh, so this is my uh, my build, my Docker file, and I'm including the boot to Docker, and then I've basically gone and did an apt-get update, uh, install Kremer utilities because I'm going to create the uh, data volume as well. And I also want to have pre-installed on this data volume the Docker containers that I want this virtual appliance to, to be using, to, to be running out of the box. Uh, then I use this command to basically install Docker into this uh, boot to Docker build container. Uh, and I also add this utility, which includes the uh, create ISO, uh, my version of the create ISO image. Um, and that's pretty much where I leave it. I define the default command as being create ISO and to pull in the uh, Docker containers that I'm actually, the Docker images that I'm actually interested in. So this is my uh, create data volume uh, script that creates my version of this image. And you can see here that I'm changing the profile for the root user. And then I'm going to create a subdirectory called OVF. Uh, and then I create my data image. And I format it with uh, BTRFS. And I label it uh, Docker data, boot to Docker uh, dash data, which is when the boot to Docker uh, image starts. If it sees any disk that's labeled uh, boot to Docker dash data, it will auto automatically mount it and automatically create the sim links such that all the Docker images will be stored on this disk instead of in the. So var lib Docker ends up being a link, a sim link back to the data to the uh, to this disk uh, slash var lib Docker. So then I mount it in a loop. Uh, and create my directories and link it up as, as it would be in my final build. The idea being is that I can then install all the Docker images that I want into this data directory, into this data disk. Once I've got that in, I can then just, uh, so this is where I'm doing the Docker pool for each of the images that I want to have in there by default. Uh, then I'm basically, uh, Let's just doing just create some other directories that I'm going to use for my my uh, virtual disk uh, my my Docker images, and then I unmount it, uh, basically kill off the uh, Docker um, the Docker process and unmount it. So now I have this image. So now I have two Im images because back here I also created the uh, make ISO. Uh, so back here I also. Uh, created the normal uh, Docker boot to Docker ISO image using their normal script. Uh, of course, I changed some of the root file system before I did that. Um, so now I've got these two images. Uh, one is the boot to Docker ISO with my few modifications, and the other is the uh, boot to Docker uh, data disk data image, which has pre-installed all the Docker containers that I want and some other directory structures that I'm going to use in my Docker, in my Docker images. Uh, and then basically I'm just converting it to uh, VMDK. So I'm just doing a convert. So this is 
my remember how I was telling you that when you do it to when you compress it to a uh, OVA file and archive single file type arrangement, you had to do it in this uh, some format uh, stream optimized, which is a yeah. Uh, you have to give it this option, otherwise it just doesn't do it. Uh, the image just fails within the first second or so. Um, so because I didn't want to deal with that at this point, uh, and it does still work with just the OVF file and the images. So for the time being, I just put that aside uh, and I just do a normal convert of the data image to be my uh, VMDK. Uh, and I've also done the same to the ISO image to convert it to a VMDK just because I think it's a little neater than, than an ISO and it's, they say it works in either case, so and it does. Uh, and then basically I build my OVF file. So the OVF file is basically an XML file that details all the image, all the things that this VM is going to contain. Uh, you can see that most of it is linking to places out on the internet for uh, the definition, uh, including the format of the VMDK. So this is the VMDK specification that specifies what a stream optimized disk VMDK looks like. Uh, I'm giving it a, a non-stream optimized VMDK, which like I said, works fine if I'm using just the OVF file. It doesn't work when, I'm used, when I compress it to a single OVA file. Uh, so there I'm defining the disks, I'm defining the network. Uh, and what else we got here? It defined in the operating system that it's uh, a 64-bit Linux. Most of this, th there is a white paper or a definition uh, for what this is supposed to look like, but it reads like uh, you know a definition, radio instructions about this long to get this much information. Uh, so most of this information I actually got from other OVI files that I downloaded and pulled apart. Um, so then you define the virtual hardware. So I'm defining that it's going to be a one CPU system, uh, sorry, a two CPU system. <coughs> and I'm defining it with this much memory. Uh, and these are my disks. And then a little further down here, I define that uh, this disk is actually, so on this IDE, because I'm referring to resource uh, parents three, which is this one. Uh, and I'm defining that this uh, virtual disk on this IDE is actually my uh, uh, disk boot disk, which is what I called it back here uh, in this one. Uh, boot disk, so I called it boot disk here, and that's what I'm referring to it in here. Um, and then I also do my data disk, and then I basically pipe that all out to an OVF file. Now, once this script is run, you end up with uh, with this. Ignore that first run thing. That's a, my first attempt. The the time that I was trying, you end up with this. So I have my boot to Docker VMDK. I have my sysaid uh, data VMDK. I have the OVF file, which is the definition of the VM arrangement set up and the OVA file is basically uh, the two VMDKs and the OVF file compressed. There is the option for a manifest file as well but then you need to do shards on all your files and all this other thing and I found that it works anyway so I didn't bother. Uh, so if I go to my uh, if I go to my disk here and I run this, you'll see that uh, the VirtualBox rec virtual recognizes the uh, file and it tells me this is what I've got in this file. It includes the disks, the, the VM images that are sitting next to it. Um, and you simply hit import and it creates this virtual image. And from there you can basically start it.
Come on. Ignore this stuff. Basically saying it doesn't have a mouse. It's a text-only virtual machine, so it doesn't have a mouse. One of the things I want to customize a little bit more is for it to create a SSH key and that sort of thing, mainly because I, the management software that I want to put on top of this to sort of like allow me to do upgrades for the Docker images that I'm going to be running in this, I don't want to actually put in the, uh, the VirtualBox image on its own because that means I have to update the VirtualBox image if I want to update the, the management platform. Right, which is just going to be a couple of command line stuff to you know upgrade my uh, virtual appliance and all that sort of thing. So rather than do that, I want to have my uh, management platform to be another Docker image. Uh, and so that Docker image would then SSH back to the root uh, image, the base image, and do the Docker commands and upgrade and that sort of thing there. And then come back in. So if I do the SSH keys, uh, then all, and I have the Docker image, the management Docker image with the SSH keys in there, I just, just have to update the management tool as a Docker image rather than try to update the whole virtual appliance. Yep. Um, that, that's a really good idea. Um, well, I like the plan so far. Um, for the SSH keys, we think you have like some sort of central authority that says, all right, I approve these SSH keys that The, the SSH keys are only really going to be used locally, right? So the the management software, which at this stage is just going to be a couple of commands such as, you know, upgrade my virtual appliance, you know, uh, start my virtual appliance, stop my virtual appliance, that sort of thing. Uh, it needs to come back to the host to run the Docker commands because I don't want to go and map uh, Docker sockets through and all that sort of thing. So it's just going to be... Uh, the only thing that's going to be using these keys is the uh, management image back to the physical host underneath it. And that's all it's really going to do. Yep. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So you can see here the two images that I put inside when I built the data disk. You can't really see too much about the how the thing is arranged because this tiny core Linux does all, most of its stuff in scripts and boot scripts and things like that that are not really immediately obvious. Um, but if I go to this uh, uh, this mount point here, uh, SDB, if, uh, lib docker, uh, you'll see that it has the uh, the same sort of basic functionality there, uh, and we should find that if I actually go to the root for uh, lib docker. You should find that uh, varlib docker is actually a link to my data disk. So all the Docker containers, all the Docker, all the persistent stuff is actually on the data disk. And that's pretty much it. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. <laughs> between the different Docker images. Yeah. Um, Docker typically, when you start a Docker image, it typically uses an address of on each of their Docker containers of 172.17.whatever. Um, and the idea is that 
Docker to Docker, uh, Docker image to Docker image, or Docker container to Docker container, I should use the proper terminology. Yeah, that's, you can just talk via that 172 address. If you're going outside the physical machine, or in this case, the virtual machine, then when you start the Docker image, you do Docker, Docker run, that's IT, and you might put something like P80, uh, column 8080, and then, uh, I don't know, I don't really have an image here to do this with, so I'm just going to do whichever. Um, I'll do the Tomcat one. What did I do wrong? Publish. Uh, what am I doing wrong? It's such a small. One of the things I want to change is the size, the number of characters on this thing, because it uh, drives me nuts on how small it is. Uh, sorry. Then why didn't it like it? This eight tomcat shell. I uh, thought it was. Ah, no, that's right. Sys aids tomcat seven. Uh, Docker run. Yeah, but I wanted to demonstrate what the what it does. Yeah. Let me do it this way. Sorry. Okay. No, I didn't know that. Uh, provided not. Uh, anyway, the the idea is that you would then have your uh, you would specify the port internal and external, and what it would do. What it would do is it would take this port 80 on the physical machine, or the virtual machine in this case, and map it through to port 8080 inside the container. So that, that address that, we, that I said all the containers get created with, it just picks a, a, an IP address at random. Do you? I thought that was optional. Okay, let's try. No. I'll figure it out. <laughs> but anyway, the the idea is that that uh, it creates the Docker image. I'll just start it without it. So in here. You'll see that my IP address is 172.17.0.2. So it's picked one at random from the pool of addresses that it has. And if I'm on another part from that machine, uh, I can if another container can talk to this machine at that at that IP address without any configuration or further changes or anything like that. If you want a machine external to your host to talk to that container then you have to do this port mapping with the minus p option and you can define that those ports inside the uh, the docker file so as those containers get built with those ports pre-configured uh, and then it would using ip tables it would map the 
external the connections coming in from external through to the container. So it mapped the external connections coming in through to port 80 to the container IP at port 8080. So you get that uh, mapping through that way. Sort of like a port forwarding type arrangement. Yep. I'm unsure if you could do IPsec. I would imagine so because it doesn't really care too much about these sorts of things. The idea is that anything that you run at the host level, you should be able to run within a container. You would probably have to do some sort of uh, privilege mode or whatever. Like I was saying, most of the uh, capabilities are locked down inside the container. But so you could do it outside the container and then map it across. Uh, with the newer versions of Docker, you actually have the capability to not have to go through this uh, special IP address. So with, with the newer Docker images, with the newer Docker versions, you actually have the option to do networking one of three ways. You can network it the way it's always been done, that it has its own little IP address that's isolated from the rest of the world, and you have to do this port forwarding to get the port to come through. You can map it to the same network stack that another container is using. So you could fire out one container over here, and then you can fire another container over here, and you can say, for the networking in this container, I want you to use the same network stack as this container is using. And then as far as this container is concerned, it's using the same network stack with the same IP, and they are the same. At the network layer, those two containers are intrinsically tied together. The third option now is that you can actually run the Docker container with uh, networking of host, which means the networking layer is not isolated between the container and the host. The networking, the container is actually using the host's network. So then anything that's in the host, it, it will have the host's IP address, it'll have the host's uh, IPsec arrangement, whatever the, whatever the host is doing at the network layer, that container is also doing. Sorry, I still can't hear you. <laughs> With that option, you they would be in the same stack, yes. So you, you've got the three options for networking now. You can have your own little network and stack, networking stack within that container, or you can share the networking stack with another container, or you can share the same networking stack as the physical host. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, I love it. Uh, uh, you know, any other people doing exactly the same? A lot of people are playing with a lot of things on Docker. I don't know if anybody's doing trying to do a virtual appliance out of it. Uh, but then there's a lot of people trying a lot of things, so it wouldn't surprise me. All right, I think that's it. Thank you. Oh, by the way, we usually go to the pub after this. If anybody wants to join us up at the, it's usually the Piem Piemont Bridge Hotel R pub. Uh, you're welcome to join us. Uh, no, at this stage, all I've tried is virtual appliance. So it could just be a quirk of virtual appliance. But yeah, yeah, I, I do intend to try it in VMware because my whole point, the whole goal of this is that I can give this just yeah. give it away and it's like, okay, you know, it is the virtual like, appliance yeah because most of the customers that this software is used on yeah. are installing this on windows oh, yeah so. and they're installing on windows because they don't know what they're doing with linux uh, yeah, so, so you know it's easier to get it defined in a